good morning and welcome to Reedy Creek Baptist Church. Really glad that you can join with us today. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Whether you're watching this online or in person at our church services, we want to extend a very warm welcome to you. What a beautiful day it is today that I'm recording this. The sun is out. Life is good. Bless you. Just a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. First of all, I just want to send a thank you and a cheerio to some of our wonderful friends, Gary and Jill Hona. Gary and Jill, thank you so much for all that you've done around the church at Reedy Creek Baptist over a number of years. We pray that God will continue to be with you as you go back home to New Zealand to live. And you're going to be missed, but we know this is the right decision. But thank you for all that you have done. And we look forward to visiting, visiting you in that wonderful country of New Zealand. God bless you both. Thank you once again for all that you have done. Coming up, we're going to have what we call Reedy's Winter Warmers. This is going to be great. So throughout the month of winter, the months of winter, that, that's obviously June, July and August. At every one of our services, whether it's before church or during church or after church, it's going to be something different, something special that is going to be happening. And we'd love for you to be a part of our services here at Reading. It's going to be a great time being together. Some lots of fun as well. On the 17th to the 19th of June, uh, Chris Wiseman is going to Tenerfield. You may remember that a group from this church went down to Tenerfield to help with the church down there, with a couple of families down there. Well, he's going back down there to do some work over that period, and he needs somebody who's got some experience with concrete. If you are that person, and give a little bit of time, then please see Chris Wiseman. And next week, Jim, Robbie, and Ross Salmon, they're going to be heading off to Tara where we have a, a bit of a partnership with the local church there and as you know we've been doing some physical work with some people who've got some needs there. Now we just want to say God bless you guys. Thank you very much for going back up to Tara. Wonderful to see this partnership happening but thank you for your time and commitment. Church let's remember to remember them in our prayers. We are going through the book of Romans and today Pastor Robbie is going to be speaking from Romans 8, that wonderful chapter. And also during this service, we're going to have a mission focus as part of our May Mission Month. We're going to be focusing on Cambodia and particularly the work of Global Interaction and Baptist World Aid. So thanks for very much for being with us. Really appreciate it. May God bless you.
mission. It's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? You know, Jesus came on a mission. He came to rescue us from our sin through his life and his death and his resurrection. But he also came to reveal the kingdom of God and what it looks like to have a relationship with God. And he asked us as his followers to continue on with that mission of making disciples. Now, one of the places that Reedy Creek Baptist Church has invested heavily into the sharing of the gospel is in Cambodia. Now, we support and continue to support missionaries who desire to introduce Cambodians to Jesus. And alongside that, we also have a church partnership with Baptist World Aid and their work in Cambodia. Why do we support Baptist World Aid? Well, it's because their mission is to tackle the injustice of global poverty so that all people can enjoy the fullness of life that God intended. Our ongoing support of Baptist World AIDS work in Cambodia enables four different organisations on the ground to make significant impacts in the pursuit of justice. Light of Hope, Food for the Hungry, Chab Dae and Peace Bridges are all highly valued organisations that are doing wonderful work, particularly in this COVID season, you know, that's seen thousands of people lose their jobs, it's seen this children out of school as we've had here, it's been good, we had government assistance has been made available, but it's been quite difficult for a lot of people to access that. And statistics here show that nearly 10,000 people as of mid-April have um, tested positive to COVID. You could imagine that the numbers now would be quite a bit higher. And But the praise points um, are that vulnerable people can get help from the government uh, through relief and uh, community volunteers uh, holding training programs about you know so hygiene and social distancing it's a praise point and uh, families that have previously um, learnt how to set up gardens from home have had food supplies actually food supply has been a major issue because a lot of Cambodians don't have fridges so getting their food is literally a daily routine so when you're in lockdown that becomes quite difficult. But despite those challenges in Cambodia, Baptist World Aid um, has seen God at work in a bunch of ways. It's um, been really fantastic. And as I mentioned earlier, we also support two families who are engaged in cross-cultural mission work in Cambodia with Global Interaction. Global Interaction is the Australian Baptist mission arm of cross-cultural missions. And David uh, Moyes is actually uh, a board member of global interaction. But Kathy and Andy Staunton and their children, Charlie, Ruby and Hugo, we met them a couple of years ago, they arrived in Cambodia in early 2020 and so they decided not to return to Australia despite the COVID outbreaks that were happening in the area and at the moment they're just seizing on creating relationships, building uh, relationships and looking for opportunities for them to discover and to discern how the skills that they have uh, can be taught and that they can get alongside Cambodians and, and teach them those skills such as teaching or community development or business or theology, any of those things. Get alongside the Cambodians and, and teach them and in this, in this, while teaching them and being an example of Jesus to them. Kathy and Andy are particularly drawn to the younger generation who are kind of discovering what life is in a global world but within their Khmer culture. Let's listen to them now. Andy and Kathy Staunton and together with our three children Charlie, Ruby and Hugo we're serving in Cambodia in partnership with Global Interaction. We've been here for just on 12 months now and we're really excited by the work that's going on here and the way that God is transforming lives. Unfortunately in the last few weeks COVID has taken hold in Cambodia in a way that it hasn't previously 
with a severe outbreak in Phnom Penh and also up here in Siem Reap. Um, as a result of that, um, both Phnom Penh and Siem Reap and a number of other provinces are under a lockdown, which means it's been very, very difficult for some Khmer people to access food and you know, something that you may have heard about in the Australian media. media. Um, but we ask that you continue to pray for this situation and um, uphold the my people in your daily prayers. That would be really appreciated. Uh, yeah, we continue to do our language uh, for my lessons online um, and our children are now um, doing their school work online at home as well. But we're also um, getting ready to launch a new project that we're hoping that God will uh, use to connect to many Cambodian people and transform lives here in Sam Reap. So please stay tuned for an announcement in the coming weeks. But in the meantime, uh, take a look at this video for a glimpse of uh, what the Global Interaction team is doing here in San Thank you and blessings to you all. Back. Here in Cambodia, the Global Interaction team long to see vibrant communities following Jesus in their own distinctive ways. Whilst we live amongst and celebrate Cambodian culture, we believe the Shalom of Christ that is the wholeness and freedom our God offers can transform all areas of Khmer life. It is this redemptive power of God we see at work and long for more of in Cambodia. Through listening to and learning from Khmer people and from much support and prayer from Australian Baptists, we aim to do life with and share the love of God with those we live amongst. Here are some of the ways we share God's love here in Siem Reap. We share in life and death, in joy and sorrow, and try to communicate that God's love is eternal. We hang about with Khmer friends and neighbours and eat plenty of food to let them know we're here for the long term. We genuinely engage with and care for those we find along our path in our every day. We show others that we care for God's creation and Cambodia by disposing of rubbish correctly and thinking about environmental issues. We partner with organisations that are enhancing the quality of life of Khmer people. We teach English, mentor and train teaching and allied health staff. We mentor young adults and spend time with people. We commit to being able to speak Khmer and learn about Khmer culture in order to know our neighbours more deeply. We are refreshed in and know God's love so we can share it. We pray for others and for guidance in sharing Christ. We support local business, especially in this season of COVID-19. And we are present and plan to be around for a very long time. What are the top 10 ways you share God's love where you are? We are everyday people sharing and following Christ where we live. There is nothing special about us. We pray that just like us, you can follow Jesus where you live. Because nothing matters more than sharing God's love for the world. Through our lives here in Cambodia and yours where you are, and by our prayers for each other, may God's kingdom come here in Cambodia and in Australia. Please stay tuned for some exciting plans we have for the near future here in Siem Reap. The other family we support in Cambodia is Megan and Tristan Criley. Now, you might recognise them as we interviewed them on through Zoom for our online services just a few months ago, and they've been in Cambodia since 2008, but they had come home last year for the birth of their third child and you might remember when they were sharing with us that they were requesting prayer for two specific things one was that the last part of their financial needs would be met before they returned back to Cambodia and two for visas that would enable them to return given the current uh, COVID climate that was going to be really difficult and it was very open-ended but the great news is that God has answered their prayers and they've returned to Cambodia they're there today as we speak and they're in the process of setting up a small steel fabrication 
business, um, where they'll teach new skills and use that steel fabrication business as a vehicle to which to share the gospel to the people of Cambodia. So there's a lot of things going on in Cambodia that we contribute to, but there's also one more cross-cultural work that we're supporting through global interaction. Mike. Now, I can't actually show you a picture of Mike or be specific about where he is due to the heightened religious tensions in the areas, but Mike has been set up and ready to go to Southeast Asia as a teacher for about six months now. However, he was had been held up through the COVID pandemic as well, unable to get a visa or just travel for, for that matter. But the wonderful news is that he recently got a visa and he's leaving within a few weeks. So that is fantastic. Well, that's it for May Missions Month, but I just wanted to close this little segment in a short prayer. Why don't you join with me? Father, your gospel is the most important news, the story of Jesus, the life of Jesus, and the salvation that can be found through him. And we just thank you that there are people willing to share it, to go where you have led. Today we looked at those that have gone cross-culturally and um, Lord, we pray that you will empower them to, to share their gospel, open their eyes to opportunities. And Lord, too, we just think of everyone here watching this and, and in our own context, Lord, that you may encourage us, embolden us and to share the story of your work in our lives too, that we might introduce people to Jesus as well in our own places because we're on mission as well. Lord, we commit, you know, uh, the Criley family and the Staunton family and Mike to you and the work of um, Baptist World Aid as well. We thank you for the people that work for those organisations and their willingness to serve you. Amen. We've been going through the book of Romans and last week we were looking at what our adoption as children of God actually means. Romans 8.16 says, For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And Tony really beautifully used the example of his own children two of which were adopted by he and his wife, Marsha. And these children were not Tony and Marsha's kids. They were not of their flesh and not of their blood. In fact, these kids had nothing in common with Tony and Marsha. There was an eternity of separation between Tony and Marsha when these orphans were born. And yet when Tony and Marsha adopted these children, everything changed. They no longer had a future of uncertainty because they had become fully-fledged members of a loving family. Now, these kids that had no family became a part of a family. And as fully-fledged members of Tony and Marsha's family, they were given a name, the family name. A name, it's more than simply a name that identifies someone, but a name to which they were now connected to, a story that they were now a part of, and it identified them with a people group that they now belonged to. As fully-fledged members of Tony and Marsha's family, these once orphaned kids were loved and they were cherished as fully-fledged members of the family. You know, these once Orphan kids will receive their equal share of the inheritance when Tony and Marsha pass away. They did nothing to deserve their adoption. There was nothing they could do to earn or to convince Tony and Marsha to adopt them. And there is absolutely zero chance that they could ever pay Tony and Marsha back. The adoption happened because of the grace of Tony and Marsha and their decision to love two orphaned children. In the same way, we were once orphaned kids. We were slaves to sin. We were born in sin. Maybe you could say that our father was Satan, the father of sin, and he hated us. You know, we were lost. We were helpless. And there was nothing we could do about it. 
until God, through Jesus, provided a way for us to become part of his family. And now we are children of God. We have been adopted into his loving family and we are loved by him and we love him. He has given us, God has given us his very spirit so that we can be confident in our belonging to him and sure of our salvation. This is completely awesome. By giving us his spirit, he has given us his very nature and calls us his children. We're not orphaned anymore. We're not lost. We are his. This is great. It's fantastic. And as his children, we have the privileges that he gives us. Reading from Romans 8, 16 and 17, he says, We now call him Father or, or Daddy, Abba. I'd call him Daddy or Dad. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. We inherit God's glory. That is so powerful. God's very own spirit is in us and raising us from the dead. This stuff is cosmically mind-blowing. and It would be easy just to camp on these passages. But Paul continues, and this is what we're going to have a look at today from verse 17 onwards. Verse 17, he goes on to say, But if we share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Well, that's a bit of a downer, isn't it? But the reality is, we know all about suffering. Now, our world is broken. There's nowhere we can go that is not broken. There's no one that we can meet that is not broken. Nothing and no one ever reaches the fulfillment of their potential. And everyone that has ever lived is a legitimate victim of the world's brokenness. There's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do to fix it. But the Bible is the only thing that tells us what's wrong with the world. And it's the only thing that tells us how it's made right. You know, it tells us that when God finished creating, it was good. It was very good. And something has gone incredibly and terribly bad. Something has gone wrong. And we've done things that have gone incredi incredibly bad. Sin alone explains the problem this world has. Sin is the reason we have death. Sin is the reason why we have so many so-called natural disasters. It is the reason why we have suffering and grief and war and emotional turmoil and poverty and hatred. Apart from the Bible, there is no understanding the problem of brokenness. And there is no hope for a solution. For thousands of years, people have come up with their own solutions to explain why we have this problem of pain. There's atheism, that God doesn't exist. Maybe that explains it. Or finite Godism, it's the idea that God's not powerful enough to stop pain. Or some have said maybe God isn't all-knowing, doesn't know how to stop it. There's pantheonism, that's where God is not all good, like he's half good and half bad, kind of like the yin and the yang, equally good, equally bad. But none of these solutions or ideas about why the world is broken offer any hope of fixing the brokenness, the suffering, and the pain. They try to explain the situation, but offer nothing on how to repair the situation. But the Bible teaches that God is good, that God is powerful, and that he's above and over history and creation. But his isn't finished yet. Romans 8, 18 continues. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Like, it's bad now, but when it's all said and done, we will see that it is worth it. He continues, For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. That's you and me. When we've been raised from the dead, verse 20 continues, Against its will, all creation was subject to God's curse. Has it ever crossed your mind, actually, that the world we know now 
is cursed, fallen, broken, and frustrated. That's what this planet is. Imagine how awesome this place is gonna be when God actually fixes it. But he continues, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So what's this telling us? It's telling us that suffering is the path to glory and all creation is groaning for it. Now it's telling us that we were made in glory and we will be remade in glory, but right now we're in between those times and we're suffering. Whatever it is, like emotional stress, financial hardship, relational pain, physical pain, professional frustrations or professional failures, these are the current reality of our position in history. And this is telling us that glory is behind us and there is suffering now, but that there is hope, there is glory before us. These are the times we live in now. This road of suffering, if you are a Christian, is as close to hell as you will ever be. Think about that. You know, you know the old saying, it was accredited to Winston Churchill, but it's becoming a little bit more evident that maybe he didn't say it. When you're going through hell, keep on going. We've got to walk through this to reach the coming glory. We don't stop here. And the whole creation is groaning under the weight of the suffering in these times. Creation is suffering on this road, just like we do, and hopes for a future glory to come. Now, other translations say of this passage that creation waits with eager longing or eager expectation. You know, another one even puts that the whole creation is on tiptoes to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. Because creation, like us, became a sufferer. Creation was pervaded with futility and decay and death. Have you ever noticed how the forces of nature seem to work against themselves? We've just watched this week a powerful surf surge damaging the coastline up the east coast of Australia. You know, the animal world is invaded by fear and violence, much to the disgust of, and dismay of my daughter Phoebe our cat keeps violently murdering and half-eating lizards and small snakes and leaving them at our back door. Even the most loveliest scenes of nature, while remaining beautiful, are witness to deathly animal horrors. Now, the reality is, in the same way our bodies are in this death cycle, our planet too is in that death cycle cycle. Environmentally, the health of the planet is diminishing. The animal kingdom is diminishing. It's estimated that nearly 500 species of animals have become extinct in the last 200 years. Now, Paul says it's like the planet is in labor. Now, I've seen a woman in labor. To see a woman that desperate and in that much agony, completely helpless to the irresistible forces of labor pains, that's what our planet is is experiencing the engine check or check engine light of our planet is well and truly on and flashing and sometimes it can appear that there is no hope but there is i've got some photos of emily my wife uh, lying in hospital bed nursing our our kids only seconds after those last stages of labor and those pictures capture the total exhaustion, absolutely, of the situation. They also capture just pure elation and a radiance. You know what I'm talking about as she holds this child to her chest that she's just bore. Now, I'm not about to whip out a photo and proudly show you a picture of Emily groaning and screaming in those last moments of labor, am I? That's just, it's not nice. But creation will one day be delivered from the road of suffering. And the difference between now, where we are in history now, and then in future is the difference between agony, the agony of labor and the ecstasy of new life.
So creation is groaning for Jesus to return because Jesus' first coming was for us. It was to reveal the kingdom of God and you know to enable you and I to have a relationship with God. Jesus' second coming is for everything. Creation is waiting for that moment, that moment that the coming glory will be revealed and set it free from decay and, de and death. Just like, like we get a resurrected body and we also get a resurrected planet, so to speak. It'll be made new. Won't that, that'll be a day when the planet is made new. Well, it's not only creation that groans, we groan as well, don't we? We all know about that. Verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait with eager hope for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Kind of makes sense. You know, once we've met Jesus, once we've had a glimpse of eternal life and resurrection and the glory that's before us, man, I want to get there. I want to get there soon. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. My alarm went off this morning and I went and prayed, Lord, come back the second time. Let it be today. Let me go back to sleep. Hit snooze again. Obviously, I'm here at this time. That's what this is talking about. The groaning. We all grow. The groan. The whole church groans. We all have those days. And I unintentionally groaned just so loud the other day that David heard me through the wall and actually asked me if I was okay. We all groan. Some of you groan in chronic pain. You know, maybe you don't groan. Maybe you groan because you can't see like you once saw. Or maybe you can't hear the things that you once heard and the beautiful sounds of music have become less and that causes you to groan. You know, last week, uh, Josh, my son, he had a really nasty cough and the poor kid was coughing in his sleep, literally groaning with the annoyance that he couldn't sleep well. We groan. Now, maybe you groan because you can't play the piano like you once played the piano or you can't run like you once could. You know, some people groan with fatigue and they just can't go on. They, they can't endure it any longer. They, they haven't got enough to push anymore. We groan with frustration. We groan with the stress that we wear. So like creation, we wait eagerly. Like creation, we're gro groaning for what is to come. We know it's like, Lord, we know we're subjected to futility and brokenness because of human sin. But we know the glory that is to come, don't we? That Jesus will return. But when? When will you return, Jesus? When do we get deliverance? When do we get to shine in the full glory of what you've got in our inheritance? When, Lord? Because we need you. This stuff... It's hard now. We want our resurrected bodies. What we would do to be 24 again. We want to be whole. We want to be complete. And maybe for some of us at the moment, life is really great. Praise God. Wonderful. But in the future, there will be supreme joys. Now, think about this for a second. All the joys, all the victories, all the healings, all... All the moments of peace that we have ever experienced are just a foretaste or like a signpost that points to the glory that is to come. Like, yes, we're already God's sons and we're God's daughters, but we won't be complete until we get our new bodies and the fullness of his glory. And Paul said to the church in Corinthians, he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, he goes, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed in our heavenly dwelling. He goes on later that we cry, who will rescue us from this body of death? We all groan along with creation because we have an inconsolable longing for that which our greatest joys and the best times of our lives are only a dimly foreshadow of what is to come. Someday, 
we will know the fullness of our salvation. But not today. Continues, verse 24, 27. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. For who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he searches, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. We can groan with our mouths, but often we groan with our souls. You know, others can hear the groans that come out of our mouths, but only God hears the groaning of our soul. You know, there are times when we simply can't pray, when our feelings are deeper than words could ever articulate. And as a pastor, I get, I get the opportunity to to be with people in their most sacred moments. Oh, your mum died. How are you feeling? I don't even have words. Or, oh, you've, you've miscarried again. Oh, how do you feel? And I, I can't even speak about it. You know, I was with someone, you know, in the moments that their four-hour-old son died in their arms. And I'm like, how, do you, how are you feeling? And they're like, Beachless. You just divorced your wife. How do you feel? Oh, I don't know. I can't. It's just a whirl of emotions. I can't even possibly sort, sort them out. Now, there are times that our souls are in such burdensome hurt that is so profound and so deep that only the Spirit of God can interpret the feelings and the longings and then articulate in prayer by interceding for us. God doesn't stand apart from our pain. God's not silent. He's not uncaring or aloof. But instead, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in the middle of it, in the deepest, darkest, most unspoken places beyond our understanding. And there, in that spot, Holy Spirit groans prayer for you that you cannot pray and God hears the ant and answers the prayer that we only know as some deep, unspeakable groaning and a tossing like a turning of a restless, unquiet spirit that stands before its creator and with the pains and the puzzles of the world that lay heavy on your heart. Isn't that beautiful? Holy Spirit just doesn't simply give armchair advice or watch on by and say, see you at the finish line. He rolls up his sleeves and he helps. In our weakest, most painful moments, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're surrounded by sympathetic groanings of all creation and even the Holy Spirit. And one day, one day, your groanings will be placed with the greatest glory. You know, I've been told by the women in my life that when labor is over and the child is born, that you forget all about the fearsome pain of labor that you spent nine months worrying about because the wonder of holding the newborn is so, so wonderful that the pain of labor becomes completely worth it. You know, I've always actually wondered if labor is so bad, why is the population always growing? It's because the joy of the new life far exceeds the pain of labor. And so too for us with the glory that awaits us, the road of suffering will be forgotten when all creation along with all his sons and daughters are revealed in glory. Yes, you are God's adopted child. It's a wonderful, it's an incredible reality. But for now, the road is tough. Real tough. It's tough on everything. 
Creation groans, we groan, the Holy Spirit groans for us. This period of history that we're in right now is like the pains of childbirth, but the joy is coming. The journey to glory is further along this road. And God promises you that he is here with you the whole way, right deep in the middle of it. And you are not alone. Yes, the journey at times, it's even, it's dimly lit. And down there somewhere down the road is our own death. But you can live in the utter confidence that beyond death, beyond every element of brokenness, you've already endured and you will endure in the future, that this road leads on to God's final destination, a destination of glory that will be far, far beyond your wildest imagination. This section of Romans finishes with this incredible statement of promises in verse 29. For God knew his people in advance. Now, if you love Jesus, and this is talking about you, so I'm going to personalize it to you. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose you to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen you, he called you to come to him. And having called you, he gave you the right standing with himself. And having given you right standing, he gave you his glory. So hang in there. Be patient. Don't be an immature, impatient child and have a dummy spit. Endure it. God will be faithful to all of his promises. You are not alone and soon enough you will receive your full inheritance the glory of God let's pray oh Lord you already know the cries of our heart and our deepest longings you know the pain of our open wounds that's been inflicted by the brokenness of this world Lord father dad Strengthen us, we pray. Embolden and empower us along this journey that's sometimes dimly lit. May your spirit be our light. Lord, thank you for choosing me, you know, for accepting me, for drawing me unto yourself, including me and your family. We love you and we trust you.